Colin Montgomery Baker was a brutal, ruthless, and heartless murderer who left a gruesome trail of death across the American frontier. During the Civil War, he served as a Confederate guerrilla and was unwilling to give up the fight even after the war's end. In the aftermath, he carried out ambushes against Reconstructionists, killed former slaves, and spread terror throughout the states of Texas and Arkansas for a four-year period. Baker was born in Weekly County, Tennessee, on June 22, 1835, to John Baker and his wife, Elizabeth. His father was a humble but impoverished farmer who also owned some cattle. Shortly after Cullen's birth, the family relocated to Clarksville, Arkansas. Within a few years, they made another move, settling in Texas in 1839 and eventually establishing themselves in Davis County. There, Cullen's father secured a land grant of 640 acres. Despite the land grant, the family remained in poverty, and Cullen, often teased at school for his homemade clothes and bare feet, began to stand up for himself. He also acquired an old pistol and a rusty yet functional rifle, honing his skills with both weapons until he became highly proficient. At the age of 15, he had his first taste of whiskey and began challenging both boys and men who irritated him to draw their weapons. Soon he frequented saloons, where his short fuse led to multiple bar fights. He earned a reputation as a heavy drinker, a braggart, quarrelsome, and malicious individual. In one of these altercations, a man named Morgan Culp knocked him unconscious by hitting him in the head with a tomahawk. This incident seemed to temper his anger temporarily, but the respite was short-lived. Several weeks later, on January 11, 1854, still sporting a head bandage, Baker married 17-year-old Martha Jane Petty and settled into a quiet life as a farmer. However, he grew weary of this routine and returned to his old habits just eight months later. During one night out drinking, a heated argument with a youth named Stallcup escalated, enraging Baker. He grabbed a whip and mercilessly beat the boy, nearly killing him. Baker was subsequently charged with the crime, and he confronted one of the witnesses, Wesley Bailey, at his residence, shooting him in both legs with a shotgun and leaving him lying in front of his house. Bailey succumbed to his injuries a few days later. Before Baker could be apprehended for the murder, he fled to Perry County, Arkansas, where he sought refuge with his mother's brother, Thomas Young, remaining in hiding for nearly two years. While there, he fatally stabbed a man named Wortham during a dispute about horses in 1856, and he then fled back to Texas. However, he returned to Arkansas upon learning that he was still wanted for the murder of Bailey. During his absence, his wife Martha gave birth to a baby girl, Louisa Jane, on May 24, 1857. The next year, he briefly went back to Texas to bring his wife and daughter to Arkansas. Sadly, his wife passed away on July 2, 1860, and Baker left their child with his in-laws in Sulphur County, Texas. He never saw his daughter again. In November 1861, he enlisted in Company G of Morgan's Regimental Cavalry to join the Confederate Army. In July 1862, he married for the second time, marrying Martha Foster, who was unaware of the murder charges against him. His name appeared on the muster roll for September-October 1862, and he received pay through August 31st, but he was officially marked as a deserter on January 10, 1863. Subsequently, he joined a group of guerrillas known as the Independent Rangers, loosely affiliated with the Confederate Home Guard. Their initial mission was to track down and apprehend deserters from the Confederate Army. However, they exploited the absence of most men who were away at war and committed various acts of intimidation, rape, theft, and violence. Anyone with property was deemed an enemy and labeled a Union sympathizer. The widespread lawlessness became so severe in some areas that many people chose to leave. Shortly after Baker joined the Independent Rangers, they engaged in a long-standing feud with another group called the Mountain Boomers, who were Union guerrillas. Both bands roamed throughout Arkansas, carrying out indiscriminate acts of robbery, arson, and murder. In November 1864, a small group, mainly consisting of elderly individuals, women, and children, sought to escape the chaos and headed west with their possessions and wagons. 
However, while crossing the Saline River in the Wachita Mountains, they were caught up by Cullen Baker and his independent rangers. Supposedly, Baker and his men saw their attempt to leave as unpatriotic, but in reality, they needed little reason to target them. When the group of settlers refused to return, Baker pulled out his pistol and shot and killed their leader. He then promised the rest of the group that he wouldn't harm anyone else if they agreed to go back to their homes. However, once the remaining settlers returned to Baker's side of the river, he swiftly directed his rangers to shoot and kill nine other men and pilfer any valuables. This gruesome incident became locally known as the Saline Massacre. Following this, the local residents had had enough and started actively preparing to confront the murderous gang. Yet, when news reached the criminals about this, they fled with their ill-gotten gains and the numerous horses and mules they had stolen. Towards the end of 1864, Baker was inside a saloon in Spanish Bluffs, Arkansas, wearing a Confederate hat when he was approached by four African-American Union soldiers who requested identification. With his pistol drawn, Baker turned to face them and shot, killing a sergeant and the other three soldiers. After the Civil War came to an end, one account reports that as he was heading home, he encountered a group of travelers in Sevier County, Tennessee. Among them was a black woman whom he subjected to verbal harassment before fatally shooting her. He then settled with his wife Martha in the vicinity of the Sulphur River area in southwestern Arkansas, taking on the role of manager of the line ferry. However, this period was short-lived. Martha fell seriously ill and passed away on March 1, 1866. By many reports, Baker was deeply affected by her loss. Nevertheless, that didn't deter him from proposing to her 16-year-old sister, Belle Foster, a mere two months later. Belle declined his proposal and instead married a schoolteacher and political activist named Thomas Orr. Baker began to torment Orr, attempting to provoke altercations, striking him with a tree limb, and visiting his school to ridicule, curse, and issue threats in front of his students. By this time, the era of Reconstruction had commenced in Arkansas and Texas, a concept that Baker deeply detested. He, along with another outlaw named Lee Rames, organized a gang that operated in the Sulphur River bottoms near Bright Star, Arkansas. Engaging in robberies and murders, the gang was responsible for at least 30 deaths, with many victims caught off guard, ambushed, or shot in the back. Baker and his gang also traveled to Texas, where he killed John Salmons, who had previously killed a gang member, Seth Rames, the brother of gang member Lee Rames. He also killed W.G. Kirkman, a Reconstruction official, and a man named George W. Barron, who had previously taken part as a member of a posse hunting him. The gang continued their outlaw spree in Queen City, Texas, and Texarkana, Arkansas. On June 1, 1867, he made his way back to Cass County, where he entered the Rowden General Store, gathered some goods and exited without paying. The store owner, John Rowden, then went to Baker's house with a shotgun, demanding payment. Baker assured him he'd return to settle the bill, but on June 5th, he murdered Rowden instead. Subsequently, Baker returned to Arkansas, and while boarding a ferry, he encountered a Union sergeant who recognized him. He killed the Union officer, but a private managed to escape and report the killing. Following this, Union forces relentlessly pursued Baker. On July 25, 1867, he engaged in a dispute with several Union soldiers near New Boston, Texas, which swiftly escalated into violence. In the ensuing gunfight, Baker was shot in the arm, but he also killed Army Private Albert E. Titus. This resulted in a $1,000 reward for his capture, whether dead or alive. In December 1867, he traveled to Bright Star, Arkansas, where he rendezvoused with a group of men planning to launch a raid on Howell Smith's farm. Smith had recently hired several freed slaves. During the assault, one of Smith's daughters was stabbed, another was struck with a club, and a black man was fatally shot. However, Smith put up a strong resistance, leading to a shootout in which several raiders, including Baker, were wounded, with Baker sustaining a gunshot wound to the leg. On October 24, 1868, Baker and his gang were reportedly involved in the murders of Major P.J. Andrews, Lieutenant H.F. Willis, 
and an unnamed black man in Little Rock, Arkansas. During this attack, Sheriff Standall was injured. Was By this point, Baker's co-leader, Lee Rames, had started to question Baker's leadership, believing that his actions could lead to the gang's downfall. Rames openly defied Baker, who eventually backed down, resulting in the gang disbanding in December 1868. All members, except for dummy Kirby, sided with Rames. Baker and Kirby headed to Bloomberg, Texas in January 1869, seeking refuge at Baker's in-law's house. It was there that both Cullen Baker and Dummy Kirby met their demise on January 6, 1869. The exact circumstances of their deaths remain uncertain. One account suggests that Baker's father-in-law and his acquaintances poisoned a bottle of whiskey and some food with strychnine, causing both men to die from poisoning. Subsequently, their lifeless bodies were riddled with bullets. An alternative version indicates that Thomas Orr, with whom Baker had a long-standing feud, led a small group of men who ambushed Baker and Kirby at the Foster residence, ultimately shooting and killing them. Following their deaths, their bodies were dragged through the town of Bloomberg and later taken to the U.S. Army outpost near Jefferson, where they were put on public display. Thomas Orr was believed to have claimed some of the reward money offered for Baker's capture. Baker was laid to rest in Oakwood Cemetery in Jefferson, Texas. While he had deserted from Morgan's squadron, the Confederate cavalry unit is mentioned on his grave marker. Subsequently, some romanticized his actions as defending Southern honor. However, his track record reflects that he was a merciless killer who would murder anyone who provoked him, regardless of their allegiances. He is estimated to have been responsible for the deaths of around 50, 60 people, and both authorities and historians regard him as one of the most ruthless killers in history. Born in Monterey on August 11, 1835, Tiburcio Vasquez had a family history tracing back to one of California's earliest settlers. His great-grandfather had arrived in California as a young man with the Dianza expedition of 1776. As a young boy, Vasquez received an education and could speak, read, and write English. His life of crime began in 1852 when, at the age of 17, he attended a local fandango with his older cousin, Anastasio Garcia. During a brawl, Constable William Hardmount was killed. While Vasquez wasn't directly involved in the murder, he and Garcia fled the scene. A friend of Vasquez's who had been present during the fight, a man named Jose Higuera, chose not to flee and was subsequently lynched by vigilantes the following day. Hiding in the hills alongside Garcia, who was already a known outlaw, Vasquez quickly learned the trade from his cousin. He soon joined a gang of other lawbreakers, eventually rising to become the gang's leader. Excusing his crimes by telling everyone that he was punishing the whites for discrimination against those of Mexican and Spanish descent, he ranged up and down Central and Southern California, stealing horses by the hundreds. During the spring of 1857, he was apprehended by the authorities after stealing a herd of horses in Los Angeles. As a result, he received a five-year sentence at San Quentin. In 1859, he managed a brief escape, but was recaptured when he was once again found stealing horses, leading to his return to prison. He was eventually released in 1863, and initially, he made a short-lived attempt to live lawfully. However, he quickly reverted to a life of crime now including armed robbery among his offenses. In 1867, he faced arrest once more for an unsuccessful attempt to rob a store in Mendocino, which resulted in another brief stay at San Quentin. Following his release, he returned to Monterey and engaged in a violent altercation with Abelardo Salazar over Salazar's wife, leaving Vasquez severely wounded. Seeking refuge at Conchua Creek in the coast range, Vasquez spent some time there to recover from his injuries. Nonetheless, it wasn't long before he resumed his criminal activities. On August 17, 1871, Vasquez and two other outlaws carried out a robbery of the Visalia stagecoach while it was traveling between San Jose and Pacheco Pass. They didn't elude capture for long, as they were chased by a posse led by Sheriff Charles Lincoln. In the ensuing pursuit, one of the outlaws was killed. Vasquez was wounded, and the third member was apprehended. 
Despite his injuries, Vasquez managed to escape once more and sought refuge at his Cantua Creek hideout. Upon regaining his health, he resumed his life of crime. On August 26, 1873, Vasquez's gang targeted Snyder's store in Tres Pinos, located in San Benito County. During the robbery, they not only made off with approximately $200 in gold, but also tragically killed three innocent bystanders. While he had already been a wanted man before this crime, the killing of these three innocent individuals intensified the pursuit of Vasquez and his fellow outlaws. Governor Newton Booth promptly offered a $1,000 reward for his capture, and this amount would increase significantly as Vasquez continued to evade law enforcement. In the following months, Vasquez persisted in his life of crime while managing to avoid capture by hiding in the canyons around the Tejon Pass. One of his favorite hideouts was a steep rock formation, now known as Vasquez Rocks, located about 40 miles north of Los Angeles. By December 1873, Vasquez and his gang had returned to the San Joaquin Valley in Fresno County. On December 26th, they pillaged the town of Kingston. Leaving their victims tied up, they looted over $2,500 from two stores. As the series of robberies continued, the news prompted an increase in the reward for Vasquez's capture, initially to $3,000, then $6,000, and ultimately to $15,000. In response, sheriffs from Fresno, Tulare, San Joaquin, Santa Clara, and Monterey counties assembled posses to track down the Vasquez gang. Vasquez's womanizing habits would ultimately lead to his downfall. While hiding at the cabin of Greek George Caralambo, a former camel driver for General Beale, the outlaw seduced a local girl, resulting in her becoming pregnant. This action angered one of the girl's family members and a former trusted associate of Vasquez, Abdin Leva. In response, Abdin Leva contacted the authorities and agreed to provide evidence against Vasquez. Armed with this newfound information, Los Angeles Sheriff William Rowland quickly closed in on Vasquez. News of his capture rapidly spread, and journalists clamored for interviews with the outlaw. Vasquez told reporters that he considered himself an honorable man who aimed to see California return to Mexico. He was then transferred from Los Angeles to San Benito County and subsequently to San Jose for his trial. Vasquez attained celebrity status and became a folk hero among fellow Hispanic Californians. Hundreds of people, many of them women, flocked to visit him. The charismatic Vasquez entertained his visitors by posing for photographs and offering autographs. He even sold many of these photographs himself from his cell window to fund his legal defense. In January 1875, his trial commenced. Although he admitted involvement in many of the crimes attributed to him, he vehemently denied ever having killed anyone. However, his pleas fell on deaf ears as he was found guilty of two counts of murder in the Tres Pinos incident and subsequently sentenced to death. Governor Romualdo Pacheco denied his plea for clemency. On March 19, 1875, Vasquez was hanged under the supervision of Santa Clara Sheriff John H. Adams. His sole utterance from the gallows was, Pronto. He was laid to rest in the old Santa Clara Mission Cemetery in Santa Clara. Vasquez's loyal lieutenant, Clodovio Chavez, fled to Arizona after Vasquez's capture. On November 25, 1875, Chavez met his demise, being shot and killed as he resisted arrest by lawmen near Yuma, Arizona. 